Thanks for joining us for the third article of the Apostles' Creed, The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit. I'm Sarah Stenson, and I'm joined by Chris Krogan and Lars Olson. Yes, as we go over to Lars, you'll be noticing a big change this week as we'll be doing broadcasting in color. Really? We're going to get excited by the upgrade to color? We're going to take it a step at a time. Chris, how about you get us started in brilliant color? It would be my pleasure. No matter the Christian tradition or denomination, all believe and confess that part and parcel to being a Christian is being made holy. Another word Christians use for the process of being made holy is the word sanctified. So, on this point, all Christians agree. Now, you might ask, if all Christians agree that being a Christian makes one holy, why do we have so many different traditions and denominations? Well, this is where the agreement ends, namely in what people understand to be the cause and process of sanctification and its end result. So, let's restate where Christians agree. The Holy Spirit's job is to sanctify Christians. Fair enough. So, what's the cause of the disagreements? For those who follow in the teachings of the original evangelicals, like Luther, the disagreement is rooted in not understanding the difference between the law and the gospel. As we'll see in this episode, when one doesn't know this distinction, then sanctification is understood to be rooted in and demonstrated through the law. Let's say it in another way, without using theological language. Most Christians believe that the Holy Spirit makes people holy by making them better morally, by making them better at following the law. If you take a moment to stop and think about that, you might start to understand why divisions arise if you believe holiness is measured by how good you are at the law. Take, for example, everyday decisions and the process of stepping into a voting booth. Just think of how contentious the conversations are surrounding everyday social issues. What's the right way to serve the poor? What is the moral way to deal with a pregnancy that threatens the life of a mother? Is there such a thing as a just war? Does the death penalty cross a line? When the distinction between the law and the gospel is absent, then sanctification, being made holy, finally is understood only in relation to who gets to claim the moral high ground. Arguments arise in an attempt to demonstrate who is better at the law and how God's law ought to be interpreted and fulfilled. As debates over the law start to play out, the divisions in the Christian community are more and more numerous. Now let's turn our attention to how the original evangelical understanding of the distinction between the law and the gospel changes and reshapes the conversation. Now keep in mind that when we talk about the evangelical understanding, we are not just talking about another theory or approach. Actually, we're talking about what scripture says and how that informs the way Christians are made and subsequently act in the world. Let's start by looking at the 10th chapter of Hebrews, verse 10. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Clearly, being made holy is brought about through Christ. The same understanding is found in the first chapter of the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Paul declared that Christ Jesus became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Moreover, Paul says that those sanctified in Christ Jesus are the ones who call on the name of the Lord. This leads him to say in a number of places that Christians don't boast in themselves or their works. Rather, whoever should boast should boast in the Lord. Paul echoes this same understanding in the second chapter of his second letter to the Thessalonians, where he wrote that Christians are chosen by God from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification, through the Spirit, and through belief in the truth. What we find in Paul's writings and all of Scripture is what Luther picked up on when he spoke about justification by faith. Calling on the name of the Lord is faith. Faith in Christ is ultimately one's righteousness before God. Remember, 
Luther's evangelical breakthrough was his recognition of what justification by faith meant according to Paul. And recall, justification is apart from the law. It is only through the gospel. Keeping that in mind, it's easy to see that if you fail to recognize the distinction between the law and the gospel, you won't understand justification by faith. And if Paul's letters offer no distinction between justification by faith and sanctification, then, like justification, sanctification, too, must be apart from the law. Righteousness by faith in Christ is not something distinct or logically different from sanctification. The two are essentially inseparable. To further the point, we can turn to insights provided by renowned 20th century theologian Gerhard Ferdi. Ferdi was known for saying that sanctification is simply getting used to being justified by faith alone. In an essay he wrote on the topic, he identified that the German language helps illustrate the point. The German word for being saved is das Heil, which means not only saved, but also a sense of being healed. What's interesting is that the German word for sanctification is die Heiligung, which, if translated literally into English, would mean being salvationed. Essentially, sanctification can be understood as being salvationed or saved. Ferdi wasn't coming up with anything new here. Moreover, the German language does pretty much what the Apostle Paul's Greek language does, as Paul identifies Christ not only as our redemption, but also as our righteousness and sanctification. The Greek word Paul used is agiosmos, which can be translated into English as sanctification, sacredness, and holiness. Now let's return to Paul's understanding of justification. In the same way, justification is not by works, something we produce, neither is our holiness and sanctification. Christ Jesus is our sanctification and holiness. At this point, it's quite clear that the distinction between the law and the gospel not only pertains to Christian justification, but also to sanctification. For if justification was by the law, then justification would be by the works of the law and we would be in charge of it. The same then is true for sanctification. As Paul clearly says, it too comes about through the work of Christ, not the activity of the law. So, we don't play a role in sanctification any more than we do in justification. Now, remember how we began this episode, talking about some of the root causes for division amongst Christian groups and denominations. Nine times out of ten, there's a disagreement concerning the law. Not just what the law says, but how it shapes what one understands to be the end product of Christian faith and life, holiness or sanctification. This leads us to speaking about how the distinction between the law and the gospel shapes what we understand to be a sanctified life or a life of holiness. To get at this, it's helpful first to talk about what happens when people think holiness comes through one's activity in the law. The first thing that happens is self-analysis, turning in on yourself. This leads to self-justification, incessantly making a case for why you say what you say, do what you do, and even look the way you look. Inevitably, it consists of a struggle to be moral and climb to the greater heights of a life lived according to the law. It's a life full of anxiety, attempting to establish your reason for existence, aspiring to be a better person, and finally attempting to avoid any accusation of making mistakes, let alone sinning. By contrast, the end product of holiness as a result of the gospel is centered on being justified by faith. Let's review what justification by faith entails. To be justified by faith means you have faith in Christ, and not just that he exists, but that he exists for you. And what is it he does for you? He forgives you all of your sin. And what are those sins? Well, it's your sin against God himself. By now, you can see how different this is from being justified by the law. 
instead of avoiding the accusation of sin, to be justified by faith is to admit you are a sinner. Once you succumb to admitting you're a sinner, then no longer are you chasing after your identity in the law. Remember what we said a person experiences when chasing after righteousness in the law? It's a life full of anxiety, striving to become something you're not, constantly attempting to establish your own worth and identity. Now, take the opposite of those traits and activities, and you'll start to get a sense of what it means to be holy from the evangelical perspective. It's being comfortable in your own skin. It's being at peace with who and what God has made you and called you. It's getting used to and grateful for having your sin named and forgiven. It's experiencing the rhythm of going through the consequence of sin, which is death, and being raised up a new person in Christ. It's not worrying about whether you're going to make it through tomorrow, rather living life at its fullest today, not for yourself, but for others. So to be holy, that is sanctified, from the evangelical perspective, is to stop trying to escape the world and your human limitations, and thus to be freed to be the very creature God created you to be. You know, I've got to be honest, this color really does make a huge difference. I agree. I believe we've mastered color television. Dare I say we take it a decade further? Tune in next time to find out just how far we can take production into the 20th century. Dare I say the 21st century? Let's take it an episode at a time and not make any promises. There you have it. No promises on how updated this production will be once we dial it in. Your guess is as good as ours. See you next time.